um, it's going to be a part of your homework. And then uh, it's just something I've been meditating on. It's just Philippians 4, 8, 9. Uh, I'll just open our time up talking about that really quickly. Philippians 4, 8, 9. Uh, let me read it. I don't have it on my PowerPoint because uh, it's not pertaining to what I'm talking about with suffering. But it's helpful. It's really helpful because um, what it says is, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything pray worthy of praise, think about these things. Um, what you have learned, uh, this, and I'm, I'm reading it from the uh, English Standard Version, what, uh, what you have learned and received and heard and seen, um, that, that, that's, that's key right there. Learn, receive, heard, and seen in me. So just all of what he's imitated, uh, put into uh, practice these things. The NIV says, put into practice. Practice these things, though. And, the, and God and the God of peace will be with you. Uh, through this time, there's so many different things. I mean, for real, so many different things. We're watching on Netflix, Hulu, um, so many different things we're trying to entertain ourselves with. Um, and then we flip on the news. We're, we're, we're kind of thinking about what the what what the next update's going to be. And the more our minds are consumed with that, the more that we think on those things, we cannot appreciate what God is trying to teach us. Uh, and I think that when we look at what is lovely, what is true, what is honorable, pure, um, commendable, there are several different things that we can just give God thanks for. Um, and we can be able to uh, recognize that it's not over. Um, but God, it, God has more for us as, as the body of Christ. That's going to be a part of our homework just to kind of exercise that in our mind and meditate on that throughout this week, um, throughout these next few weeks, uh, next couple of days. Let me open our time up in prayer before we get into our lesson. Uh, Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you that you're one that is pure, that is lovely, that is true. Uh, you're one that is able to embody all things perfect. And so, Lord, we ask that we... We see your totality through your word. We see the all comprehensive, all powerful, all knowing God uh, in Isaiah 53. And we uh, a, a, are able to pull from the entire biblical narrative as to who you are and what it means to suffer as Christians and to grow in relation to that. For we pray these things in, the, in your dear son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, we're going to talk about the role of suffering in the Christian life, the role of suffering in the Christian life. Uh, part of this, I'm going to read, uh, Isaiah 53, and then, uh, I'm going to give, uh, just some, not an exposition, but more of a, of a concept of understanding suffering in light of Isaiah 53. And this concept comes out of, um, a Christology, so a study of Christ, understanding his patterns of suffering, how he suffered, the patterns of suffering, and you can also see it in books like Second Timothy or in Philippians, etc., where he is actually encouraging uh, the people of God and his disciples not to respond with violence, not to respond with vengeance, and so he teaches us a way to suffer that is... Um, Sorry, I'm looking behind me. Somebody's going to drop something off on the porch. Uh, you know, like, um, and so, and so we, when we look at this, I want us to really feel the passage of Isaiah 53. The object of today, uh, this evening, is to develop a deeper understanding of the connection between our spiritual formation and our suffering. We will explore the implications, the applications, and transformative aspects of how suffering is deeply embedded into the Christian journey. Oftentimes, we mitigate our, our ways of suffering, especially in the Western Hemisphere, because we compare it to other people's sufferings. We don't feel as if we're suffering as much as someone in a remote area, or we don't feel like we're suffering we, um, as much as our neighbor. We're always comparing it, but when we compare it, we do not learn or grow from what God is trying to teach us in our suffering. 
Someone suffering in the suburbs may look different from someone suffering in an urban context or a poor area or a rural area or in um, overseas in a remote area um, that's totally desolate. So we all have to understand what is God trying to teach us through the role of suffering in our lives as Christians, because then that means it all comes into connection with Romans 5, 3 through 5, that we are being built up in our character, in our endurance, in our hope, and the way in which God makes us to look more like him. That level of conformity helps us then because we don't conform to the world's way of suffering. We then conform to it are to a christ-like suffering amen somebody um i i, I heard the muted amens all right let me read uh isaiah 53 and um we'll, we'll dive into it you'll see i have some um bold uh wording but if you have your bible with you um just go ahead and uh and highlight some of those words where emotionally physically um, mentally, you just see a level of suffering that that uh, that Isaiah is saying you know, through this poetic, poetic language. So here's the word of the Lord. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to, to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected. So under the, I, you see, I voted despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering. By the way, I'm reading from the NIV. I like the NIV um, when I'm reading this passage. I like the NIV a lot, um, actually, in my devotional. So um, NIV will say man of sorrows, and many of us are familiar with that. So verse three, again, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He despised and we held him in low esteem. Um, sorry, there you go. Uh, surely we look up our, we took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray each of us have turned to our own way and the lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all yet yet it was the lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer and though the lord makes his life a, an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will uh, give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life upon death, and he was numbered with transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for transgressors. All right, word of the Lord. And be God, amen, hallelujah. Uh, when, the role of suffering. So kind of five things that I'm gonna briefly go over before we break up into small, um, small groups. Um, 
So number one, deliverance of the Lord versus discipline of the Lord. Then two, suffering does not discriminate. Three, tension between growth and the absence of pain. Four, self-preservation is anti antithetical to gospel suffering. And five, uh, suffering leads to a conformity um, to the image of Christ. Uh, and there's a quote that says, God sometimes puts us on our backs to give us a chance to look up. All right. Let me let me kind of go back um, when we look at our passage real quickly. Sorry. We look at our passage. One of the things I want y'all to understand is, and through this time, is that um, there's nowhere in here that a God is being delivered from his suffering. Do you recognize that? There's nowhere in here God is being delivered from his suffering. But in every aspect, when you look at what he is, what essentially when you get to verse 12, um, his suffering has a purpose and his suffering is for the purpose of our deliverance. Isn't that interesting? That Jesus' suffering was for, the, his, the purpose of his suffering was for our deliverance, but then it disciplined him in order for us to know him. Okay, there was a level of discipline that the Lord went through, or yes, went through. Yes, huh? I, I can't come outside. Yeah, I can't come outside. Um, so this is the quarantine Bible study, y'all. Y'all, y'all gotta, y'all gotta be <laughs> gracious with me. Um, so when we think about this. Deliverance oftentimes is connected to what we see in the Psalms. We see various different Psalms. Um, Psalm 51 being one, where David is communicating, deliver me from my sin. Uh, there is a personal sin and a, co and a corporate sin. There, there is a level in which systemic sin has affected one individual or multiple individuals. Our individual sin, we also need to be delivered from, okay? But... How is Jesus actually demonstrating that he's being disciplined? Go to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 9 shows us and demonstrates to us that in the role of suffering, Jesus um, is, is actually learning obedience. It says this, in the, in, the, uh, in the days of his flesh, Jesus suffered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears. Now, Spencer, you heard me talk about this passage already last week, but I, I definitely want to highlight the fact that um, this indicates Jesus doing something loudly. That is crying and tears, an emotional response to his suffering that he is going through. Offered prayer, uh, offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears. So it was prayers and supplication um, in the middle of that. Why am I highlighting that? It's because sometimes, brothers and sisters, when we get together, because of all this quarantine, we need to be loud and crying in tears because we ain't been together for so long. Amen, somebody. But so then it also says to him who was able to save from death and he was heard because of his reverence. Although, he was a son, listen to this, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Although Jesus was the son of God, he learned obedience through what he suffered. One of the, one of the things that you will talk to many folks that are agnostic um, or even atheists, they will ask the question of why if God is good and if he's sovereign, why do we suffer? Okay, we can't unpack that. I can't unpack that within the time that we have. But that is a lofty question that's oftentimes there. But uh, isn't it funny that God doesn't alleviate the pain from himself? So why would God send, uh, why would, why, the question should be, why would God send himself through suffering? Remember Job's wife. What did she say? Kill yourself. You still praying to God? Kill yourself. He hadn't delivered you. See what he's done? And what is Job? What is Job adhere to? Job continues to adhere and fast to God because he trusts God. So let me keep 
keep reading. So he says he learned obedience through suffering. So we learned di the discipline of obedience. That's a spiritual and godly discipline that ought to be practiced daily. Obedience. And it's difficult to practice, practice that a lot of times when we don't know what that looks like. So obedience, oftentimes, when I was talking to my son and we were going through our devotion this morning, uh, and we were talking about what does it mean, we were reading Micah 6, 8. And the question was, what does it look like um, to uh, basically image God in behavior? And he was saying, oh, to obey mommy and daddy. And I was like, and I said, well, that is a good indicator of how a child, I love that foot right there in the, in the, in the, in the Rose camera. Um, it is a good indicator that a child, in, in his view, in his scope of how he views Christ, understand this, he sees it as my obedience to my parents is a reflection of my discipline to Christ. Okay? Our obedience amidst suffering is a way that we discipline ourselves to grow to look more like Christ. So the implications of our obedience is that we may apply the way that we obey God, whatever that may look like. That may look like obeying God by um, making sure we give attention to gov government, government authorities. Um, that may look like doing what you need to do um, ethically on your job. That may look like uh, social distancing and obeying, obeying all of the rules that we have today. And so that in which we, ways we suffer, and also people suffer in different ways. So there is persecution that comes with it. People die for the faith, and yet they're obedient to the gospel in the way that they've disciplined themselves. Um, and verse 9 says, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, okay? So being made perfect is not behavior modification. Being made perfect is actually, um, in other words, being complete, okay? The Bible in 1 John always reminds us that we will not be complete until what? We appear, epiphany, before God. So we will be complete when we appear before God. So what does that mean? Suffering is a way in which we grow to look more like, I, I, can't, I can't, MJ. Uh, you got to give me a few more minutes. Um, the, it, has to, it looks like um, for the, the believer, uh, appearing before God and being complete looks like us making sure that we hold true to the gospel in whatever context we're in, okay? So, like, if you're a poor person, if you're a person that doesn't have a lot of means, okay, the, the, the deal in which when you don't have a lot of means, it's difficult to obey God when you can take shortcuts, okay? It's difficult to obey God when you can take shortcuts because you don't want to suffer through poverty. But poverty is not your issue, okay? Poverty is never the issue for the Christian because what does God promise? That he'll supply the needs of his people. So poverty is not the issue. The issue is, do you know how to obey God amid your poverty? Okay, let me talk to the person that has means in their pockets. Okay, the issue is not that because you have means, then you can simply be more empathetic to people or that you can have a savior complex. Okay, oftentimes when, when our suffering is mitigated because we don't, we compare it when we have means, we then become saviors. So then we don't know how to be disciplined to the Lord. We only know how to try to be in his position. Are y'all tracking with me? So then what does that mean? If you, if God is teaching you something in this season, whether it's through job loss, whether it's through um, difficult marriage situation, whether it's through uh, you're not used to what you're, what you, the transitions that are going on in life, whether it's through singleness, whether it's through parenting, uh, whatever it is, if God is teaching you something through this season, you have to ask yourself the question of what am I obeying and what am I trying to circumvent because I don't like it? Y'all see what I'm saying? 
So what do I shortcut because I don't like it? I don't want it to be that way. What do I try to, what do I try to remove God from on the, off the throne of my heart and my life, the lordship that he has? What do I try to do? Because I want to be delivered from it and not disciplined in it or through it. That's what the Bible teaches us. That's what our passage helps us with to seeing um, Jesus. And so then suffering does not discriminate. Jesus teaches us this because when we look at this passage, uh, we know that it is in relation to, and even when we look at Mark 9 in the Lord's week, he tells his disciples what? You'll also suffer. He says in verse 4, surely he took up our pain and bore our sorrow, our suffering. Yet we consider him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment brought us peace um, that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Okay, so let me, let me, let me uh, come back to my, let me go to, let me think, let me ask y'all this question or just think about it. When you think about suffering and you think about the, how suffering does not discriminate, I want you to ask, this, ask yourself the question, how do you try to deflect suffering by looking at someone else's suffering, comparing your suffering? How do you say, well, my neighbor is going through more, I should not complain, or I should not, let me put it this way, I should not feel. Do you think Jesus felt any of this? The affliction, the piercing, the crushing, the stricken? Do you think he felt everything that he took on from us? If Jesus felt it, we will feel it. If Jesus felt it, we will feel it. So that's pain, I mean, it does not destroy. It doesn't say that pain is only for a certain demographic of people. And here's the tension. Three, here's the tension. The tension between growth and the absence of pain is this idea that we, um, in the famous that cliche term, no pain, no gain, okay, that um, our growth comes not from the absence of pain, okay? That is the deception. And false teaching actually portrays that false teaching when you think about false teaching today it says that you don't have trouble if you do the next seven steps to the next best life you won't have any you will find that mate if you don't do x y and z no it's not a formula Suffering is not a formula. Suffering is a mosaic of issues that happen to your life, that's in your life, that God is using it to make you, to scope you. So I heard a story one time that when you think about when sculptors look at a rock, they, you see a rock, but they see an image and they chisel till they see that image. When God looks at us, he doesn't see simply uh, some, some blank sheet. He sees an image and his image that he sees is the righteousness that's been given to us through Christ. And the growth in which that happens for us is him chiseling us so that we may look more like Christ. That chiseling takes off some of the pride, the arrogance, the hurt, the pain, and the sorrows that go on in our lives. And oftentimes, is the issue for us to feel any of that because when we lose a best friend, when we go through the pain of death, when we feel sickness, when we feel loss in every aspect, what happens a lot of times is we begin to ask ourselves, why, is, uh, why can't God deliver me from this instead of why can't God grow me through this? Okay? Number three, self-preservation is antithetical to uh, gospel suffering. So oftentimes we 
as Christians look for safety in life. And the gospel doesn't teach us safety. There's nothing wrong with being wanting to be safe. I want to clarify that. But self-preservation doesn't, it, it is antithetical because the gospel is saying you've already given your life up. You've already died. Okay? Let me go to the next one because I want us to break up into these groups. And then suffering leads to the conformity, to the, uh, to a conformity, uh, I missed the, the other uh, uh, presupposition there, but to the conformity of the image of Christ. So this suffering that leads to the image of Christ helps us in the conformity, helps us to know that we don't conform to worldly standards. What happens is philosophically, we can conform to worldly standards because of what we accept in life. Okay, so what we accept in life oftentimes can look as, look as if we only want to accept what's pleasing to ourselves or the desires that make us feel comfortable. Okay, conformity is an element in which when we're conforming to God's image is a transformative work of the gospel that says that we don't transform into the beautiful nature in which God wants us to look like, which is more like Christ, unless we give up something. Isaiah 53 is a, is a picture of our Christ suffering and dying so that we have hope, that we have a life, that we have something to live for, okay? That should be encouraging to us because in our group discussions, I want us to begin to discuss some of these things uh, where we are identifying the physical, mental, emo uh, emotional suffering emotionally suffering, emotional suffering in our uh, passage. And then I want us to identify it in our lives. Um, and then I want us to ask ourselves, how has suffering contributed to your spiritual formation or growth? I want y'all to discuss that. Uh, and then explain why false teaching has led to further suffering. And if we have time, evaluate systems of sin in our society, okay? That in our society that that is uh, that is led to suffering. So, Mike, how long do you want us to be in the small groups? So, be in the small groups till we're done at eight o'clock, right? Yeah, be in the small groups till uh, seven forty-five. No, seven fifty. Seven fifty. Seven fifty, and I will. I will send out uh, those questions to the breakout rooms as well. So I'm going to put you guys in breakout rooms here in a second, and um, then I'll, I'll send you the questions. So when you get the invitation to go to the breakout rooms, uh, just say yes to that. And Mike, if you'll leave your screen as is, that would be great. So let's go to the breakout rooms.